I don't know how this got into our list of the top 10 music books of the year because I resisted it stoutly. But you insisted, didn't you, Mark? What I said was that any list of the top 10 music books of the year 2020, Dave, would have been ridiculous and wrong had it not included this particular masterpiece, uh, which is uh, right up there with the other five you've written. So congratulations for bringing the top 10. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Not indeed. at all, not at all. Now, now the book Obviously, is brought- I was reluctant, but, you know, I'll go along with no, it. I put him in a half Nelson and I gave him a Chinese burn. And he eventually gave it. Now, it's broadly about uh, the three occasions when uh, British musicians stormed the American charts and conquered America. So give us some idea of the shape of it and some idea why you wrote it. Well, I just it's uh, it's like all my books that, you know, as I say, you know, most pop music history is is like most Second World War history. It's written by people who weren't there, whereas I tried to write about stuff that I was kind of there, you know, in the sense of. Yeah, I remember the Beatles going to the United States in 1964 because I was 13 at the time. And it was a huge, it was a huge uh, kind of endorsement of our love of the Beatles, but also a kind of a national Philip, you know what I mean? In terms of Britain's self-image. It was a huge national pride. I can remember that. Really big thing. The rest of the world had found out about this thing that had come from Liverpool, you know. And uh, and I think we probably thought. You know, there was such then such a succession of British acts going to the United States and making their mark that we probably thought that this was the kind of natural shape of things to come. <laughs> and if you'd done an accounting of the kind of biggest names in rock and roll at the end of the 1960s, you know, around about Woodstock and Monterey and all those kind of things. I was thinking about this last night. You'll probably find, you know, Top four would have been from the UK, you know, <laughs> the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, you know, the, I don't know, the, the Animals, the Who, you know. These Dave people were, five. They were yeah. huge names in the United States, you know. The only, the only United States name to kind of compete with them was Bob Dylan, really. And uh, I think we thought that was going to go on forever, but of course it didn't go on forever. And... Uh, and the, the point at which it kind of came unstuck was, I suppose, punk rock, where America was still looking to Britain as, what's the new edgy thing from the UK? You know, the new edgy thing from the UK was the Sex Pistols and the Clash and so forth. And, uh, and I mean, obviously the Clash became popular eventually, but the Sex Pistols didn't happen in the United States. So that was kind of break point in that. But then there was a resurgence in the early 80s when MTV launched, by in MTV, was MTV. MTV launched in America and they just didn't have the actual material. They didn't have that many physical videos to show. No, absolutely. Because we had them all set up for Top of the Pops. And so it was the Human League and it was Duran Duran. It was Culture Club. And, all and that famously and Culture region. Club. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so it brought along all that whole kind of gender bender thing that that the Americans associate with Britain. So I wanted to write about all that, about that period. And uh, about what an unprecedented thing it was and about how, how America, certainly in the 60s, absorbed a huge amount of kind of UK culture via music and uh, how, how that kind of changed America and also how it changed the people who... Um... Is that Sorry, my phone? That's my phone just went off. That's all right. Uh, and and how, it, how it changed the people who went there and so, you know, most, well, obviously the Beatles, you know, in a classic case, I think they were, was it three out of four married Americans? Ultimately? They did. Yeah. And, uh, and then people like Rod Stewart, who kind of completely became American and became the image of somebody who sold out to America, which is something that, that we in the UK feel very sniffy about still to this. Eric Burden, a wonderful example, don't you think? Eric Burden's formerly kind of gruff, <laughs> shouty, Geordie, R&B, barrel house performer, reinvents himself on the West Coast of America as a kind of caftan wearing spiritual guru. Amazing. Absolutely. And adopts that very uh, strange uh, way of speaking, which is kind of overlaid with, you know, Californian accents, you know, over, yeah, sort of over your UK accent. Kind of it's gentle all, cat kind of uh, which all, sa- all sounds absurdly pretentious, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, 
when British rock stars talking about started talking about my old lady you, you know, at home, we go, oh, please stop that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't convince anybody. You don't really live in Laurel Canyon, you know, because we can, we can still detect the kind of Mancunian in Graham Nash, no matter how long he's been living out there, you know. And uh, the worst example was John Mayle producing I'm called Laurel Canyon. Do you remember John Mayle? None, none more British. Where, in which he appeared sort of wearing what appeared to be a kind of chamois leather pair of, 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 of shorts, you know, and I think building a campfire or something, wasn't it? He, he, of course he was. He indeed building a campfire. Yeah. Blues, blues from Laurel Blues Canyon. from Laurel Canyon. Yeah, they all did that because they, they were all absolutely besotted with the idea of going to the United States and kind of becoming American, you know. Yeah. So I'm just interested in, in that whole back and forth. And, and once again, you know, this book came out, when did it come out? September. And, yeah. uh, and um, you know, what we've seen since lockdown is it make, makes me wonder if, if that's an era, era never to be repeated, you know, because there was a long period of time when the UK groups, when they got to a certain level of celebrity in the UK, what do you do next? You go to America. And if you make it in America, as Pete Townsend points out, you can sustain a career because it's a huge market. You make quite a lot of money if you work hard enough. Um, it's very difficult to sustain success, success just in the UK. And, and, you know, now that we've had, we're going to have a year of nobody going back and forth between the United States and the UK. And, this is undoubtedly a business that's going to get more onerous and more expensive. And you, you just wonder if that drift, that natural drift has ended now and it won't happen the same way. So making it in America was the great animating dream behind British pop music. It was. From the Beatles right through. I don't know if it will be anymore. I suppose that's, that's one of the points, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> I was also feeling there was some kind of cultural exchange between the two, because then there was phases when some of the American groups were really, really popular. Came, over came here, back. You know. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the book kind of finishes with, um, you know, the the the, uh, the mid '80s, Bruce Springsteen and Madonna, who were who were the classic cases of of American pop success in that there were solo acts, and they were kind of about America. It's of America of which they sang, really. Whereas the leading uh, UK acts tended to be groups, and uh, and they're a very different kind of thing. It ended that whole era of groups for Americans, didn't it? Suddenly, yeah. then it became Springsteen, it became uh, Madonna, it became Michael Jackson, Prince, Michael Prince. Jackson, and then yeah. the whole boom in the kind of solo, yeah, uh, female pop singers that that, that we yeah. have now. Because one of the things that excited Americans about when the Beatles flew to America. You know, Paul McCartney says he was looking down and from the plane and thinking, why, why would the Americans want us? They have loads of groups. Well, because the truth was they didn't really have loads of groups. They had instrumental groups, but they didn't have groups like the Beatles. They didn't the have them at all. No, they, they had, Those they, kind of things. They had, in the mid-50s, they had Buddy Holly and the Crickets, who nobody really thought of as a group. They were just a backing group and Elvis's group. But there weren't actual bands. Well, well there's there a were... wonderful section in your group, in your book, about when they appear on the, at the Ed Solomon Show. And all these acts suddenly decide Springsteen, Tom Petty, Donald Fagan, Steve Van Zandt. There's a list of all the people who are watching that night and think, I'm going to go out and form a band. Yeah, they did. Birds being a really good example. Yeah. They did. Well, the birds, yeah, but the birds classically, they, they kind of came together, then went to see Hard Day's Night. A hard Day's Night and thought we're going to buy exactly the same equipment. That's, as they that's equipment. Yeah. They, it's the Rickenbacker guitar. The Rickenbacker George, guitar. George Same Harrison's haircut. Rickenbacker guitar is a fascinating story because he only got it. He went to when they went to New York. He he had a he was a flu, didn't he? A bad throat or something, and so he was confined to quarters at first. And so Rickenbacker came around to his hotel room and demonstrated their new their new guitar. He's like, I'll have one of those. Takes it back home. Plays it on hard days, nights on. I, I should have known better, isn't it? All that kind of thing. And then, and then the birds see the film and thought, "We're going to have one of those." We're going to have one. And of then make Mr. Tambourine Man. You know, so folk rock was invented. And they start off in kind of uniform. Yeah, and they start off performing in uniform. And you make a really good point about the Stones, which I'd never realised before. The Stones going on there dressed individually. 
had an enormous effect didn't it, on what people then wore on stage, that, that you could then go off and have an individual expression of who you were. Yeah, that was a huge part of the Stones appeal and um, and still enormously influential to this day. You know, yeah. bands, bands tend to not not to wear uniforms, don't they? They tend to yeah. go for the, the Stones template. But the great thing about the Stones was that I remember seeing them on telly in those days. Every time they appeared, there was something new to look at. Somebody was wearing an interesting belt or an interesting pair of shoes. Yeah, pair of shoes, belt buckle. Yeah, that's a, right. Some mad T-shirts or something like that. Yeah, it just, just, and and it was, it kind of looked as if they just wandered in off the street. Obviously, it's slightly more polished than that, but not an awful lot more, more polished than that. They hadn't been turned out by stylists, you know. They hadn't spent the day in a Winnebago trying to get to look like that, you know. Yeah. So you know, they was a hugely important part of them. Um, of their appeal. And uh, I, I've written a lot about, about their recording satisfaction, which was done in, in 1965 while on tour in the United States. And, and that was really their first properly self penned song. Cause before that they'd done R and B covers. What a story uh, that is. And he, he, Keith, to hear dreams, the riff, doesn't he? And sort of yeah. records it into a tape recorder beside the bed. And the, I think within something like a week, they'd recorded it within about well, two they recorded, weeks. They recorded it, it twice. Out. They did it once yeah, in they did Chicago. Twice, it didn't work out well. And then they did it in LA a few days later and it worked out really well. Although Keith Richards still didn't think it was a single. Didn't think it was that good. And all the other four were saying, this is a masterpiece. It's just unbelievable. But the, but the interesting thing about Satisfaction, what made it a real turning point, is it's a record about America. It's a record about the American experience. You know, it's about... Yeah, it's about shouted, advertising, isn't it? Advertising. It's about the messages in the media. Absolutely. Yeah. And about, you know, living this mad life on the run behind behind you know blacked out limousine windows and how kind of boring it was at the same time everybody in the world every particularly every young man in the world was thinking give me that boring yeah, life I you know for just two that. minutes i was absolutely fancy that you know so the rolling stones kind of pose from which they, they the vantage point from which they made all their records subsequently was established in america and since then, they've kind of been an American band in many ways. You know, yeah. I mean, they, that they they sing an American idiom. You know, and they, they obviously think about the American market probably first. And yeah. you wouldn't really blame them, you know, because as Pete Townsend says, you kind of can't do it without yeah. America. You can't sustain your career without America. And one other thing that you you mentioned of many actually, I thought was a really good point was that the 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 guitar hero is a uniquely British invention. In fact, not even British. It's not. It's English, and it's, it's not even English. It's Surrey. <laughs> it's Surrey. It's the southern. It's kind of yeah, the hogs back just behind <laughs> Guildford, isn't it? Well, is where you've got Jeff Beck and you've it's got Ripley, you know, isn't Jimmy it? Exactly. Exactly. Walton on Thames. Yeah. All those. Ginny <laughs> Water. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. Yeah, it's and it's, it grew out of John Mayles Blues Breakers, I suppose. You know, Eric Clapton being the first one, and then. And there was Jeff Beck and there was the Yardbirds and Peter Green and all this kind of thing. And it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's first of all kind of captured, it strikes me, in, uh, in uh, the film Blow Up, you know, the great, the great murder mystery, strange celebration of uh, a Swinging London, which kind of climaxes with, with the Yardbirds doing a, doing a freak out in front of a bunch of... Uh, blank-faced teenagers uh climax with, uh, with jeff beck kind of destroying his prop guitar and that whole thing was a british idea you know it came out of the 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 blues soloists who played in john yeah. Wales blues brand and so forth and then eventually became oddly enough the thing that nobody had really expected them to be which was sex symbols you know <laughs> Nobody had ever, nobody had ever thought somebody playing the saxophone was sexy. Nobody ever thought somebody playing the piano was sexy. But a lead guitarist somehow, possibly because of the placing of the phallic instrument, you know, right in the groin and the and the machine and the maneuverability on. around stage, isn't it? As the, 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 the mobility and the and the uh, yeah, be able to to use it, it as a prop. Exactly. And it became it became about sex. Yeah, and yeah, you know, that's why. The, as the one of the reasons the book's called, you know, overpaid over sex and over there is that sex was a huge part of this. 
is that one of the strange unconsidered uh, outcomes of the, of, the, of the British invasion was that British became, Britishness became, for a while, sexy. You know, the, the sexiest men in popular music were people like Mick Jagger. You know, the sexiest movie stars were people like Terence Stamp and so Yeah, and, and uh, American magazines were, were, were flocking to London in 1965 and, to and, make that point, weren't they? And it was really odd because the the they were uh, there was such a a change from the kind of beach body hunk archetype of american male sexuality you know yeah. they, a lot of these guys look puny as if they were need, in need of a good meal you know what i mean they grown yeah. up with rationing you know they were bomb site kids many of the many of yeah. these kids and so they when they went to america there were, as as what's his face calls uh, the guy who wrote "Love Me Do," the very early memoir of the Beatles, Michael Braun, is it? He said they were a different, a different kind, kind of people. People, yeah, that's and, right. And I think it was a, a really, totally different species. A totally different <coughs> species. And so, you know, and they, they were they, their mannerisms, what yeah. they wore, their hair, the way they looked, yeah. the the dynamic between them, their sense of humor, yeah. unbelievable. But also, I think it fascinates me that if you look at, you know, you look at another group, you look at the animals, and then the first few records of the animals, maybe let me take you home, House of the Rising Sun, I'm Crying, Don't Let Me Be My Son Stood, It's My Life, we got to get out of this place. They're all kind of takes on American rhythm and blues done by a group from Newcastle. And they are, almost without exception, better than the originals. They had something going for them, these groups. They just, they had an authenticity and an authority, which is still there to this day. And most of the Americans, I mean, I'm not talking about the black originators, but America didn't have rock bands who could do that. They but weren't that But it good. is such an irony, is it? Because that was largely American music. Extraordinary. <laughs> But it, yeah, so, they were playing two Americans. So, so yeah. don't let me be misunderstood uh, is a Nina Simone song, which the animals did. Yeah. And Bruce Springsteen will tell you that if you want to know where Darkness on the Edge of Town came from, go and listen to the animals version of Don't Let Me Be yeah. Misunderstood. It's the same riff all yeah. the way through. Yeah. That's where he got it from. So those well, we were talking were about hugely influential to the, yeah. the generation coming up, the Springsteens, the Tom Petty's, all those kind of people. We were talking about Eric Burden earlier and, and the, the, the transformation of him going to America. And I was going to read an extract, Dave, oh, uh, from your book, uh, which is about the opposite, really. It's, well, it's about someone else who, who, who is about to, to uh, undergo a huge reinvention, but is in a group that are behind the curve rather than ahead of it. And it's the Hollies. It's the description of and it's fantastic. It's, 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 it's the, the rebirth of Graham Nash is about to begin. <laughs> and uh, it's your section about this starts when you saw them uh, in Yorkshire in 1968. Uh, and you said, at the Batley Variety Club, <laughs> as an audience of car salesmen and hairdressers drank double diamond and grazed on scampion chips, the Hollies delivered their club set. Lots of hits, faultlessly harmonised, a handful of covers, some comic patter. They explained Bobby Elliott's wearing a cowboy hat and saying that he had a head for figures. There was a slot in the top. Brilliantly remembered. <laughs> I Fantastic. remember that joke from 1968. That's really, really good. It was a show rooted in the entertainment tradition of the waning decade, designed to please everyone. This was the exact opposite of lots of the shows that were gaining ground after Monterey. These were designed to please only the newly converted. What I couldn't know, this must seem rather bizarre, me reading out your, your personal memory. What I couldn't know. Shall I, shall I go into bed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll start with that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Get Walter Huttle bottle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I couldn't know was how painful Graham Nash was finding the experience. He was like a husband who decided to leave his wife for another woman, but was been, meanwhile compelled to accompany her to a number of family functions. After one of these Batley shows, Nash took off the white suit and floppy bow tie, which was the band's outfit when they were playing for young marrieds in the West Riding of Yorkshire, went back to the Alton Grange Hotel, which overlooked a golf course, on the outskirts of Leeds, cracked open the hash he had painstakingly secreted among his luggage, took out his guitar and wrote Lady of the Island at the beginning of Teach Your Children. Graham Nash had reached a fork in the road. On one side there was the opportunity to continue as an artisan, on the other was the opportunity to claim uh, the prestige of an artist. And what decided him 
was the chance meeting at the end of August 1968. It's amazing, really, because it's only a year before Woodstock. It's incredible how much yeah, happened. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. 1968, taking advantage of a short break in the Hollies schedule, he flew to Los Angeles to be with Joni Mitchell, who is now living in Laurel Canyon. When he rang her from the airport, she told him that David Crosby and Stephen Stills were with her. And when he got there, Crosby and Stills sang one of the songs they'd been working on together and Nash chimed in with a high harmony. They were all enraptured by the effect. It took him the rest of the year to leave the Hollies. The other four felt betrayed. His final show with them was a benefit called Save Rave. He wore a dinner jacket and stood in the receiving line to meet Princess Margaret afterwards. The following morning, he set off for New York he had his acoustic guitar with him, everything else, equipment, wife, houses, contract and money, he left behind. He spent the day after Christmas flying to Florida with his new girlfriend, Joni Mitchell. The term girlfriend would have seemed laughably quaint in English in the new milieu in which he would soon find his way and alter his speaking voice. As would the expression boxing day. It had surely been a long trip from Audsell Board School and it would get even stranger in the years ahead. Day. <laughs> Marvellous. That's, that's terrific. I could not recommend this book more. Here it is. Oversexed, overpaid, and over there, how a few skinny Brits with bad teeth rocked America. It would be foolish not to avail yourself of a copy if you haven't already. <laughs> Go for it.